Okay, uh, the Hangout has started now. Uh, tonight we are doing a debate on an important doctrine within Reformed theology, which is irresistible grace. Uh, the Affirming uh, the positive position would be Christian anarchist, and denying it would be Trad Al. Uh, we will have a 15-minute opening statement, uh, one rebuttal period, a seven-minute cross-examination period, and two-minute closing statements. Uh, without uh, further ado, I will give the floor to uh, anarchist. I'm sorry if I rushed that a little bit. First off, I would like to thank my uh, uh, opponent for accept for, for being the one who proposed the debate on the concept of irresistible grace, and it's an opportunity to have a discussion about this and to engage in this on a formal level. I would also like to thank Cameron for moderating this, the second TULA uh, debate he's moderated in regards to uh, the Perseverance of the Saints debate, which also somehow managed to turn into an easy believism debate as well. But enough about that. On to the uh, topic itself. Uh, what is irresistible grace? We need to make sure we're defining the terms properly in, uh, in order to understand what it is we're debating about. As it is explained by Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, an Introduction to Biblical Doctrine, Irresistible grace has been defined as, quote, a term that refers to the fact that God effectively calls people and also gives them regeneration, both of which guarantee that we will respond in saving faith. This term is subject to misunderstanding since it seems to imply that people do not make a voluntary, willing choice in responding to the gospel. Now, to, now to comment on what uh, Professor Grudem has said in his uh, book here on systematic theology concerning irresistible grace. Irresistible grace has at times been misunderstood, especially concerning the name irresistible grace. The first thing to get off the table is that it doesn't mean that there are times we can't resist, that every time we cannot resist uh, God's grace, but rather that while we do at times resist God's grace, it focuses on the fact that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and that if any time God desires and wants something done, he will choose to do so. In fact, we can see this concerning Job chapter 42, verse 2, where Job responds to God, I know that thou canst do every that can I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. This, of course, being quoted from the King James. So concerning this, we also have in Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, which it was written in Aramaic, and it is said, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, as and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, or say unto him, What doest thou? And it's interesting to note that according to the uh, lexicons in the Aramaic, the word that's used for stay, as in stay his hand, means to hinder. So none can hinder the Lord's hand. As well as say in Psalms 115 verse 3, But God is in the heavens, he has done whatever he has pleased. As well as Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times and the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. But while we focus on the concept of God and his powerful omnipotence, we have to focus on the concept of what exactly saves us, and that is the saving grace, the irresistible grace. Now, the one thing is that by our own wills, we are not able to receive salvation on our own merits by any form of synergism due to the fact that our heart is deceitful, as stated in Jeremiah 17, 9. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, we are explained to be full of evil. We love darkness rather than light, as John chapter 3, verse 19 says. John chapter 6, verse 44 simply states it, that we cannot come to God on our own, and that no one seeks God on his own nature, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. And they are 
helpless and ungodly on their own, Romans 5.6, as well as being a slave to sin, Romans 6.20, John 8.34. And, and to point the final th points out, in Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 3, we are stated as 1, dead in sin, and 2, a child of wrath by nature. So, along with this, what is able to save us? Well, obviously, the concept of grace. The, the loving and undeserving grace by God Almighty, as it is stated, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And as John Chris and his church father John Christendom stated in his homilies on Ephesians, he comments on this particular passage by saying, quote, But what is clear that through his power we have believed that he has raised Christ. For to persuade souls is a thing far more miraculous than to raise a body. I will endeavor to make this clear. Hearken then, Christ said to the dead, Lazarus, come forth. And straightway he obeyed. Peter said, Tabitha, arise. And she did not refuse. Notice the, the parallels that Christendom is making here concerning the passage in Ephesians and how it sounds similar to the doctrines of irresistible grace. Whenever Christ wanted Lazarus to come forth, he knew what he was doing, especially in an audience full of people, and he knew that Lazarus, with the command that he gave to Lazarus, Lazarus would come forth. He immediately obeyed because of the power of God's grace through that instance. And then Peter, likewise, giving that same concept and power to Tabitha, through the power of Christ. So, whenever it comes to the grace of God, whenever the time is right, and God truly wants it to happen, there is no way you can resist it at that point. As it says in Ephesians 2.4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, whereeth he loved us. And in, so, to go back a uh, Furthermore, to comment on another part, let's look at some instances in the Bible concerning where this irresistible grace has uh, been pointed out. In Acts chapter 16, verse 14, we look at a certain woman named Lydia, who is a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. And it said that, quote, which worshiped God, heard us, referring to the apostles, specifically the apostle Paul, and whoever he was traveling with, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Now, the main common objection that would be that is normally addressed in sort of debates like this is the pet is the they'll say there's a context between verse thirteen and then supposedly on to verse fifteen. So we read here, and on the Sabbath we went out on the city by a riverside where prayer was wont, was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the woman, women, plural, which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thetira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which we were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now the reason I mention this up, even though there has been no objection made thus far in the debate, is because I need to at least address one aspect concerning this. That while you have the context in general, focus upon one thing. Is this, quote, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of. So it gives the condition that in, that the reason why uh, Lydia came to them to hear the things which were spoken of Paul, it was because the Lord had opened her heart. She had received what it was known as the effectual calling. 
The effectual calling is what we would properly call the doctrine of irresistible grace now, and we especially affirm this in my denomination known as the Southern Baptists in the Baptist Faith and Message, Chapter 5, which we state the following being, quote, Election is the gracious purpose of God, according to which he regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. It is consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It is the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness and is infinitely wise, holy, and unchangeable. It excludes boasting and promotes humility. All true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ by his Spirit will never fall away from grace, but shall persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair their graces and comforts, and bring reproach on the cause of Christ and temporal judgment on themselves. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So, we have that being done, and then, of course, we have the Reformed uh, view itself within its own confessions in chapter 10 of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 10, section 1, stating, Those whom God has predestinated unto life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time, effectually to call, by his word and spirit, out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving them a heart of, unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power determining them to that which is good and effective and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Yet, so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. That is section 1, chapter 10 of the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. And of course, it has its scriptural quotes, but also notice one thing. There was a quote that sounds very familiar to what was stated in the Old Testament. And that is what, because you can see a concept of irresistible grace in the Old Testament as well. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6 says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Now note, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. It's not saying he might circumcise that heart, thine heart depending on the concept of you're resisting or not, but he will and gives no condition Later on, he makes the promise that he will circumcise the ha their hearts and the hearts of their seed. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, where we get the obvious uh, case here. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart, or the heart of stone, out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So we even have the Old Testament coming into case on this. Now the last thing I want to point out uh, is a new and Old Testament passage referring to this form of concept being irresistible grace to its infants that are would be part of the elect. And if you want to look more into that, the London Baptist Confession of Faith mentions in section 3 of chapter 10 of the effectual calling, the concept involving elect infants. But concerning the passages, Luke 1 verse 15 says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Now, notice right there we have the Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Spirit, being present in an individual inside the womb, of somebody. Now, if last I checked from what this passage is about, that supposedly is uh, John the Baptist. So why is John the Baptist, is he having this as a baby? I mean, babies can't resist it, and that's one of the points. The last verse I will point out is this. Psalms 22, verse 9 through 10, But thou art he that took me out of the womb, Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. 
I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Referring that Jesus, well, not Jesus, that God himself is Lord and reigns over David. And that since he was in the womb, that we have this concept that the Spirit came to him and has made that promise that David is going to have God, Yahweh, as his Lord. And with that, I end my time, and I wish my opponent uh, good luck with his opening statements. All right, uh, your 15-minute uh, uh, opening statement period starts now, Trado. Okay, thank you. Can you uh, hear me just fine? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, again, I would like to thank my opponent for this opportunity to make this. Um, now, prior to uh, bringing up the subject of Calvinism last week, I didn't know about the five points of Calvinism specifically. I also didn't know about the specific uh, point of irresistible grace. So, I sought to figure out what exactly is meant by irresistible grace, and to do this I went to a number of Calvinist sites online. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get one definition that seemed to be agreed upon by all of them. Um, in fact, there are some Calvinists who think there are only four points of Calvinism. Um, so, after going in circles for a little while and trying to figure out what the current ideas are, I decided it would be best to go back to, well, what did, Cal what did John Calvin actually teach? Um, what I found out, what I found out about this actually surprised me because it was more starkly opposed to some of the ideas that um, are firmly Christian and firmly believed by the vast, the vast majority of Christians throughout time than I had imagined. Um, now the principal idea behind John Calvin is that he rejected free will. Uh, he did this specifically and said that men yield to grace not because their consciences are more tender or their faith more tenacious than that of other men, but rather they are evidence of God's own faithfulness to save them from the power and penalty of sin. Man is so corrupt that he cannot decide and cannot be moved to follow after God. Thus God must powerfully intervene by drawing the sinner to himself. So Calvinism argues that regeneration actually precedes faith, in the sense. Um, this is the entire problem, because, well, St. Augustine and every other Christian theologian that I've ever read agrees that we are helpless without God, and that we must have God's grace to be saved. None of them deny free will. Um, now, Actually, uh, some of the followers of John Calvin were much more assertive of this than Calvin was himself. The, uh, the Puritan scholar Perry Miller characterized Calvin's view of regeneration as a forcible seizure of holy rape from the surprised will. John Gill said that this is not a forceful act, but yet he bends the will as well as enlightening the understanding, giving a heart of flesh, sweetly alluring the power of his grace. So we see that the will is involved in all of these. The problem with taking away free will from the idea of Christianity is that it does not correspond to any of the reproaches, any of the commandments, even any of the actions of Jesus Christ. Everywhere in Scripture it is assumed that men have the will to accept God or to reject Him. They have the choice. Um, without this choice, it is absolutely pointless to give them commandments. If the only way they can obey these commandments is by a special act of God and not by their choice to follow God's grace. 
Um, fortunately, scripture never says anything. It never hints that men lost free will at any time, including after the fall. It is nowhere in Genesis. Uh, it is nowhere anywhere else. If this doctrine of John Calvin, especially as explained by, uh, what's his name? Especially as explained by some of his scholars, some of his followers, especially Harry Miller, um, then scripture should have said something like this, I am the door and I will rape you. Uh, that is not what Jesus Christ said. He said, I am the door, knock, and it will be opened to you. This implies an action on the part of the sinner to accept Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, this doctrine does not interfere with the idea that God knows the future, that God even deliberates the future by means of divine providence, because simply, God is omniscient, that means he knows everything, past, present, and future. And by knowing this, he can determine the outcomes based on his own decisions in creation as well as maintaining the universe. So, we see that. God can do these things without interfering with free will. He can see what actions we would make without anywhere taking away our responsibility from making them. It is true, perhaps, that God uses our will. It is true that he persuades us by his grace. Again, many of the scripture quotes he referenced even have that word, persuade, you know, this indicates that we do have a will and that God works on the will. He does not force it. He does not take away our free will. That is an extremely different position. If man has free will, then irresistible grace is irresistible only in the sort of sense that, for example, a Snickers bar would be irresistible. Now, I don't mean to demean the power of God by saying that. I'm trying to talk about an analogy. Um, you can say that a Snickers bar is irresistible because of its flavor, because of its appeal, but that does not take away our free will. Uh, it's your fault if you're fat, you know. Um, Calvinism teaches that our free will is at least effectively negated. Now, on a certain level, I don't think you even need scripture to refute this idea. And I'll explain why. Um, every human culture throughout history has rested on the idea that men have responsibility for their actions. If they do something evil, it is not just because of their depraved nature, it is because they chose to commit a crime. Thus, all mankind, all mankind with the use of reason, believes that man has free will in this regard. Uh, some of them did not admit this. In fact, many philosophers in the 19th century, maybe even before, rejected the idea of free will. But we can see what a mess philosophy is today. Anything goes. Um, no matter if it corresponds to reality or not, we can say that everything is an illusion, including free will. Um, so my point is that if free will is an illusion, as John Calvin effectively taught, then God is not only a deceiver to all Christians, God is a deceiver to all mankind. Because all mankind is given to believe in free will. It is part of his nature to believe in free will. He cannot function without believing that he has choice in the matter. According to Calvinism, it was not actually Stalin's fault that he committed mass murder, killed tens of millions of Christians, and destroyed our churches, turned other churches into stables, and mockery of our faith. He was just doing what was in accordance with his nature. Whose fault was it? Well, ultimately, it was no one's fault but God's. This, I believe, is blasphemy. Um, but it is what Calvinism teaches. Again, you cannot reconcile this idea of God raping our will 
or without forcing anything upon our will, without essentially denying free will exists. This also fits in with other points of Calvinism, such as the idea that man is helpless of himself, that he is absolutely inclined to evil, that he cannot desire good. So, on that level, I don't even need scripture to refute this idea of Calvinism. I think it is easily refutable by the world we see around us, by logic, and by the idea that the Christian God is not a deceiver. The Christian God is supposed to be a good God who can neither deceive nor be deceived. But I could go further than that. Um, in scripture itself, so many actions of Jesus Christ do not make any sense if free will did not exist among his people. When he wept over Jerusalem, he said, how often I would have gathered thee under my wings like a mother hen gathers her chickens. And he wept, perhaps, I don't, I don't remember if that was the first time, but it was a very significant moment. It must have been surprising and even frightening for the apostles. And yet, if Calvinism is true, then Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, had no more choice in rejecting God than robots. If they could only accept God by God's irresistible grace, and if God had not given them that grace, then it was no one's fault but God's. Thus we would have Jesus Christ crying over spilled milk, something that was entirely his own fault. This changes the nature of God absolutely and completely. In fact, this, this doctrine is so insidious that I cannot help but believe that it is inspired diabolically. If we remember the first action of the serpent in Eden was to convince Eve that God was lying to them, that God is a deceiver. This is what Calvinism teaches because even though our free will is so manifest to all men, even though our responsibility for our actions is absolute in the sense that we have a choice and that we are not forced by anyone, even though this is true, it would seem that according to Calvinism, it's just an illusion. God is deceiving all of mankind and everyone to whom he has given the scriptures, which make it clear God punishes us for our choices if they're bad, and God rewards those of us who choose him. I, uh, I think this covers the majority of my opening statement. I don't believe there is any way Christian anarchists can address this except by addressing the definition of irresistible grace again, because, as I said, I referenced what John Calvin wrote referenced what Miller wrote. Um, these are, of course, early disciples of Calvinism, but if this is not what Calvinism is today, then it would seem that the doctrine of Calvinism has changed. Unfortunately, this as well refutes the idea of irresistible grace, because the doctrines of Jesus Christ do not change. Jesus Christ gave us the new and eternal covenant, and when he said it was eternal, that means it is not bound by time. Time has no effect upon it. Thus, it is absolute. It is absolutely um, um, false doctrine. I think I've covered my opening statement. I. Uh, I can see for the rest of my time to my opponent, if that's okay. Uh, sure, I will reset up the uh, next time. Uh, as soon as I get the uh, timer set up, uh, Christian Anarchist's uh, first rebuttal period starts. Mm -hmm. All right.
your uh, first rebuttal period starts now. All right. The first thing I want to address is concerning one thing. First off, John Calvin did not invent the tulip, of course, just to point out to some people. Rather, that it was the Senate of Dort uh, that happened sh shortly after uh, Jacobius Arminius's uh, death. And it is well explained in the Canons of Dort, though I don't think we see the actual tulip thing there itself. The acronyms are elsewhere uh, written, but that's mainly where we get the concepts. And the con and the even the acronym itself is when the idea was proposed at the Synod itself. Now, to address another thing, uh, Calvin, first off, did not deny uh, free will in altogether sense, which is why, also, like I mentioned earlier, when defining irresistible grace, we have to be careful what we define by free will. For John Calvin believed we, we had choices, we made choices, and that we are aware and fully aware of our choices that we make. However, what he denies, rather, is libertarian free will, which is that we can choose things that aren't even according to our own nature, that we are so free in our will that we can choose whatever we, whatever we can, whatever is possible. However, what he affirms more is a compatibilist free will, which is that while we make decisions, we choose what we desire. We choose what is according in our nature. And of course, as he affirms in Total Depravity, which that's a doctrine for another day, he affirms that because man is sinful and desires sin, most likely with that, they are going to choose sinful things. And that is the concept that he held to. And unless he is born again by the grace of God, he is going to desire as a as a vengeance in Ephesians chapter 2, a child of wrath, they're going to be doing things according to their will unless born again, then a renewing and a regeneration in spirit, body, and mind comes into play. Now, I noticed also that there are times that Calvinism in general was discussed, but I want to focus on specifically the thesis that we have agreed upon, which is concerning irresistible grace and debating this topic alone. So irresistible grace, again, I will explain, is that the basically also known as the doctrine of effectual calling, and I will read section two now of the effectual calling in the London Baptist Confession of Faith to help maybe elaborate on this a bit more. Quote, the effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, nor from any power or agency in the creature, being wholly passive therein, being dead in sins and trespasses, until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit. He is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it, and that by no less power than that which raised up Christ from the dead. Now, earlier my, uh, my opponent had mentioned that you know, we didn't even need to go into scripture because it defies logic and common sense and even what some of the even early church would have mentioned. But I would point out that compatibilism is one of the things in philosophy and logic that people will go to. And normally the reason why some people lean to libertarian uh, free will would be the same as any of the classic liberals would hold to it is because the idea of what they desire and what they want just feels good and they can't imagine having certain rights theirs that infringe on others rights though would be taken away from them but it, you can look into people like Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Athanasius, Cyprian, Ambrose, Cyril of Jerusalem and Jerome all people who affirm the idea that if you're going to make a statement concerning doctrine it has to be confirmed by the scriptures as the final authority. Now, concerning that, let us actually take a look into uh, a scripture that uh, Trad, my opponent Trad Owl had brought up, which is, he made the analogy that if the God of Calvinism is correct, 
then Revelations 3.20 would say, Behold, I stand at the door, and I will basically drag you. I break the door down. But, of course, he's correct in stating it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If And then goes to say, If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will sup, which in the King James term just simply means dine, with him and he with me. Now let's point out the following and focus on a hermeneutic to exegete this passage by the means of inductive study. Behold, I stand at the door. I stand at the door is Jesus standing at the door, and he knocks. There's the calling right there. Right there you see this knock being referred to is the, the calling that is by mentioned in our doctrine, the effectual calling, the irresistible grace. And here's the thing concerning the audience. If any man does the following, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup, dine with him and he with me. So if any man, whoever hears the voice and opens the door, then they will receive these things. However, there are certain people that don't hear this, such as 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, where it talks about the natural man and how he cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he understand them because it is foolishness unto him. Not only does this refer to non-believers in general, but specifically also points out to the non-elect, those that aren't not able to hear it because the sheep, as it is mentioned in the scriptures, are the people that hear the shepherd, Jesus. They hear him and they follow him. Now, to point out a, uh, elsewhere, pointing out in the scriptures, some of the basic uh, scriptures is John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it wasn't, their it wasn't man's blood, will, or involved in their own being and their flesh, but rather it was of God that they were given the ability to become the sons of God, to become the elect. Also James 1.18, of his own will beget us, he us, with the word of truth that he should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. John 5.20 For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth him, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. 1 Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, in Colossians 2.13, given the good news that was stated from Ephesians, Colossians 2.13 says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So, that is one thing that we need to take into consideration. And also, in Philippians 2.13, keeping this keyword, the Holy Spirit is the third member within the Trinity of God. So, the Holy Spirit being God, we see this. Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you, addressing to the Christians at Philippi, you both, to will and to do of his good pleasure, which everything, if God wants it to happen, will happen. I mean, read Ephesians 1.5, Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of of his will, 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called with us a holy calling, the effectual calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has been given in Christ Jesus before the world, before the world began. And I mentioned in Isaiah 46.10 that God will do all to his pleasure. The last verse that I want to point out before I end my time, is Titus 3, verse 3 through 6. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers of divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, that the kindness and love of our God 
our Savior, toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, Time. our Savior. Time. Okay. Uh, I'm going to set up Traddles. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Tradal, your uh, opening statement. Uh, well, no, your your first rebuttal period uh, starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, so it seems that my opponent shows a different definition of irresistible grace than the one I mentioned from Perry Miller and indirectly from John Calvin. I need to point out that. This entire debate was centered on irresistible grace as a point of Calvinism. Thus, I'm not trying to dispute something that has no connection with Calvinism. This is specifically about Calvinism, um, irresistible, be irresistible grace being a doctrine. Um, now, um, my opponent has quoted many different theologians. He's also quoted scripture extensively. However, this is not very helpful to this doctrine of Calvinism, the irresistible grace, because it seems that he's picking and choosing his own definition that he pleases. Um, if he wants to say that the definition of irresistible grace is different from the one prescribed by Perry Miller and the one implied by John Calvin, as I will um, go on to clarify, then he must prove it. Otherwise, this talk of irresistible grace as something other than what John Calvin and his followers taught is nothing more than a no true Scotsman fallacy and a, a very egregious one. Um, now, yes, he pointed out truly it was from the Synod of Dort. Um, and it, even, even they had disagreements with John Calvin. But um, the point is that John Calvin himself said that those who obtain salvation do not do so by their free will, but only because of the grace of God. Now, it's, there's a very, very important distinction here that it does not seem to be being clarified. I tried to clarify it earlier, but my opponent seemed to sort of miss it. That is the distinction between persuasion of the will and choice. You see, under John Calvin's language, right, his very language, that we are we do not choose salvation by our free will, but only by the grace of God. The um, the ability of free will is is completely negated. It's completely arbitrary. It has nothing to do with salvation. Uh, yes, it's very true that we are helpless without God. It's very true that we, God must give us his grace in order to be saved, and he must lift us up to a state of sanctifying grace. But John Calvin says that our free will uh, has nothing to do with it. We do not make a choice in this of our free will, but only through the grace of God. Again, this is a distinction that arises when Perry Miller says so clearly that, I mean, I don't want to repeat it because it's a very, very bad choice of words, but Perry Miller says that Calvin's view of regeneration is a forcible seizure, a holy rape of this prized will. Scripture says nothing about rape. I can't imagine how hard it would be to explain to an atheist that in order for him to be saved, God must rape him. Um, it's difficult enough as it is with all the events described in Scripture, and I'm very glad that I am not a soul of Scripture, and that I trust others to interpret the Scripture for me, more uh, qualified leaders in the Church that Jesus Christ founded. Um, but this language of Perry Miller, especially interpreting John Calvin, and uh, John Calvin's language himself, it is very clear that free will may as well not exist in this relationship between God and the 
the center. Now, my opponent says that uh, Calvin held we must choose what is in our nature, and that is most likely sinful. Um, that is not what I got from Calvin at all. Calvin was seemed to be very, very clear that our nature is uh, completely sinful, that we cannot choose to do any good, and that it is only by God's bending of our will um, and God's interference in our will that we can choose to follow him. Uh, again, my former objections regarding scripture and the actions of Jesus Christ and all the commandments we've been given to follow Jesus Christ hold true. Because, again, if all the commandments to, uh, for example, just a very simple one, keep holy the Lord's day, um, thou shalt not have false gods before me, thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, all these things are useless if we cannot obey them without the direct intervention of God into our will. Again, not by persuasion, but by actually forcing himself upon our will, by forcing himself into our soul, regardless of our choice in the matter. Again, the distinction that must be made between this and um, the clear teachings of Christianity and of my own church, which I believe is the Church of Jesus Christ, is that while God can see the future, God can manipulate events throughout history, and God can determine exactly what is the best way to create and maintain the universe, that does not interfere with the free will that he gave us. Again, in Scripture, in, in Genesis, says nothing about our free will being hindered, about us being absolutely prevented from choosing God when he offers himself. The, uh, the uh, writings of John Calvin and Terry Miller make it very clear that free will may as well not exist. All of the commandments in Scripture, all of the, uh, of the warnings that we will burn unless we keep God's law are completely useless if Calvinism is correct. And uh, something else I might point out, this, this doctrine of Calvinism, um, what, what option does it leave for the soul? This doctrine of irresistible grace, it leaves a person to wonder less how to serve God and more if he's been saved. And that's completely subjective, but still it switches the focus from our cooperation with God to our uh, salvation by God, when God has clearly throughout all of history and in the scriptures, he has asked our cooperation, he has told us if we don't cooperate with him, we will burn, and that alone implies that the decision is not inevitable, it is not a forced one, we still have a responsibility for it, and you can't have it both ways, either you are responsible for your choice, or else you are not. If you are not responsible for your choice, it is absolutely unjust that you should be burned in hell. Any distinction that is made between uh, God forcing himself on the will and lacking free will is, is completely, as far, as far as my opponent has explained, that there is no explanation as to how it is logical. It seems completely arbitrary. Um, uh, again, this debate was not supposed to be about sola scriptura, um, and I don't think it's necessary to go into that. However, I'm deliberately avoiding the writings of my own church councils in order to avoid any debate on Holy Scripture. So basically the problem is, as I'll, as I'll wrap up, um, the problem seems to be that my opponent is picking and choosing his own definition of irresistible grace when Clearly, from the outset, this was supposed to be the irresistible grace of Calvinism, and many of the followers of Calvin, Calvin himself, seem to indicate that free will 
is arbitrary and it may well it may as well not exist in the context of irresistible grace. Um, so I, I I'm afraid this issue has not been resolved, and until my opponent can demonstrate that my definition of irresistible grace, which is given by Perry Miller, referring to John Calvin, is incorrect. Until he demonstrates it's incorrect, then he has no case. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will start. Uh, oh, I need to add time. Okay, this uh, starts our uh, cross-examination period. Uh, try not to get too heated, and uh, it, it obviously will to uh, as much of a degree as it will, just due to the nature of it. But uh, try to refrain from any violence and things like that. Uh, I was, yeah, I, I just had it's kind of a just moderator thing. But uh, I will uh, start the timer now. Anarchist, uh, you you go. Okay. All right. So the first question that I have. Um, so, was Perry M Miller the the guy you quoted? Was he a theologian besides being a uh, historian? Uh, not that I know. I'm not sure how you define a theologian. Okay. So you mention only two definitions from what I hear, of, of, ma mainly from Perry Miller and John Calvin, which we'll get to him in a bit, but. Uh, is Perry Miller's definition of irresistible grace to be considered the objective standard for the definition of the doctrine? It depends whether you're speaking of Calvinism specifically. I mm -hmm. think. Okay. Could you name any other scholars or church historians that focus on Calvin's theology that agree with Perry Miller's conclusion? Uh, not off the bat, but I didn't research it in depth. Okay, so so far all you have is Perry, what Perry Miller has studied and his conclusion as a historian as well as your own look into the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. Well, I could mention other Protestants who disagree with Calvin very strongly, but in mm -hmm. terms of Calvinism itself, no. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that, uh, that according to Calvin, uh, that the definition that I held to was different than what he held to concerning what irresistible grace was, correct? Yes, it seems so. All right, could you quote anywhere within Book 3 of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, or any book for that matter, where Calvin defined explicitly the doctrine of irresistible grace, the uh, chapter and book? Uh, no, I can't say chapter and book right now. Okay. So... Let me ask this then. Based upon uh, the idea of compatibilism that I mentioned, do you think you mentioned earlier that your conclusion would be considered logical and rational? But based on compatibilist free will, which is the idea that while things are determined, we're able to have this still sense of choice. That while things are not based upon our nature, we still make choices and have a will. Uh, do you think that that in itself is illogical? Uh, it has not explained. It has not been explained how it is logical. So I don't. I don't know. I don't have any reason to think it's logical. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we can choose things um, outside of our own nature without the grace of God? Um, outside of our nature, yes, I believe we can contradict our nature. Mm -hmm. By what means would we be able to uh, do so? Well, for example, it is a sin against nature to mm -hmm. commit uh, a, a number of different crimes that have been so that by itself mm -hmm. would seem to me to demonstrate the ability to conquer mm -hmm. nature. Right, but also we're said by nature to be sinners, but while it's still against certain things on that, I would also argue that certain parts of it would include that us being born again is definitely against nature because we are choosing rather the supernatural versus the natural itself. Would you agree with that? Um, could you please repeat that? Well, I was just simply saying that while you make that case, 
ICE can agree that we also can do things that are uh, against nature when we uh, go against the concept of being desiring sin, which is by nature, according to the scriptures, is by nature what we do, and that instead when we desire God, that that is a supernatural act in of itself. Wouldn't you agree with that? I don't think so, no. Okay. So, earlier you mentioned that uh, God wants people to cooperate with him. Uh, could you provide me any scripture or, or passage that states where God wants everybody uh, to cooperate with him? Well, it's very clear whenever he gives a command, for example, in the, mm -hmm. in the uh, Ten Commandments, um, mm -hmm. I am not used to citing scripture, um, verse and chapter, that is, but every mm -hmm. command he's ever given seems to indicate that we have the choice to obey it or disobey it. Mm -hmm. Right. And we, in the, reform, in the Reformed or in Protestant general position, don't disagree with that. But do you, what concerning the uh, view? Do you think that because of this, when people uh, disobey it, do you think that God didn't see this coming, or that this was something that He had no control over? Uh, no, not exactly. Mm -hmm. So you would agree that there's still some sense of uh, control happening, even though that these people did something that would be considered against his law. Uh, certainly, but it is not a control of our wills, uh, mm -hmm. far as I can tell. Right. So would you agree that uh, selling someone into slavery or abandoning somebody would be against God's moral law? Uh, abandoning someone? Um, yeah, leaving them, like, say, in a ditch or in a hole somewhere? If they're innocent, then yes. Okay, so would you say that this would then apply to uh, Joseph in, in Genesis? When he was left by his brothers? Mm hmm Yes. Right, and then when in Genesis 50-20, when he meets his brothers who uh, get put him through that act and put him through all the whole tribulations involved in being sold into slavery, uh, Joseph says in Genesis 50:20, "But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive." So by that, that even though there are sinful things that people commit, that God not only can ordain these certain actions uh, to occur, but rather that they're ordained so that some people, say like Joseph, can be used for a result of a better, more graceful purpose, such as. Uh, what was happening in that story? Uh, certainly, I, I believe God writes straight on crooked lines. Okay, thank you. That'll be it. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Trado, your uh, cross examination period starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Let me go. I would like to ask my opponent, do you know if there is a particular quote where Calvin um, says that he believes free will is intact even after the fall? Do I have a quote from John Calvin concerning where a, he talks about free will being intact before the fall? After the fall. After the after, fall. Okay, after the fall. Um, I do not have a specific quote on me from him at the moment, no. Okay. Um, do you agree that he said, in essence, those who obtain salvation do not do so by their free will, but only by the grace of God? Correct. Okay. Um, do you believe God has made this a choice? Yes, and I believe that concerning the aspect that when Calvin mentions free will, that he's simply referring to the libertarian sense and not the simple choice, because that is specifically what some of the reformers believe, except some of the hyper-Calvinists out there. Okay. Uh, can you differentiate between the free will and her ability to make choice between good mm -hmm. and evil? 
Right. The difference would be that in today's world, we j simply refer to free will as choice, but back then, just the concept of will would be, you know, the desire aspect. And we, of course, make choices within there, but if my understanding is correct. When free will is mentioned, that's referring to what we know as libertarian free will, the idea that one can make decisions outside of all natures on their own as if there is no uh, requirements for the person to make this decision. Do you believe it's possible for men to be convinced to contradict the laws of nature, to come to a, a try to rebel against nature by Satan? Uh, could you repeat the question again? Do you believe that Satan has the power to convince men to rebel against nature? Do I believe he has the power to convince a uh, man to rebel against nature? Correct. Um, I believe it's possible, yes. Um, does he do this by taking control of their will? Um, to me it would be that he tempts us and feeds us more of a, some sense of a desire, but uh, as far as how Satan would operate, I'm not, I don't have too much knowledge concerning how exactly uh, the demons work. Okay, but do you agree that Satan can and does convince some people to rebel against nature? As well as rebel against God. Yes. I believe mostly Satan tempts people to go for their nature and as a result push them further away from God. But nonetheless, he does have the ability to make some people desire to rebel against nature. Is that correct? I believe so. I just would need to know what you mean by go against uh, nature. Okay. Well, you have said that nature, um, by, by our nature, it is impossible for us to do good. Is that correct? Uh, by nature, it is impossible for us alone uh, to do any good in the in the eyes of God, yes. Um, and this is something we agree upon that we need to ourselves, correct? Mm -hmm. By his uh, was, by his grace, yes. Okay. Now, if this doctrine of irresistible grace, I'm I'm trying to get the distinction between irresistible and persuasive. Mm -hmm. um, can you clarify? A logical difference between irresistible grace and persuasive grace, or is there a difference? Well, I've never, ever, I've never heard of the term persuasive uh, grace before, at least concerning an official theological uh, position. It's a hypothetical. It's okay. asking if God can persuade people instead of um, doing mm -hmm. whatever Calvin is supposedly uh, describing. Well, as I mentioned, uh, especially concerning John Christendom's commentary on Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 18 through 19, that the act of the effectual calling is a form of the persuasion because it is stating that it is, quote, to persuade souls is a, fa is a thing far more miraculous than to raise a dead body. So by this standard, I say that persuasion is one of the means by God can use Rather, that the, when God does grace, he is persuading the soul to uh, turn away, turn and repent from his ways against, uh, to go towards the flesh and against God, and instead to come to God and away from the things of this world. So, in other words, um, irresistible grace is nothing more than persuasion by God? For some, for some people, definitely yes. Con especially concerning the soul, uh, sometimes it can be just uh, like stated in Luke chapter one fifteen, or for uh, uh, somewhere in the Psalms concerning David that they were infants yet they received the Holy Spirit. And I would assume that logically you would uh, think that uh, a baby or an infant doesn't have any. Uh, rationality to reject the Holy Spirit uh, during that instance with the Holy Spirit being that powerful. Uh, one last question. If um, this irresistible grace is simply persuasive, mm -hmm. um, 
except in the case of children who have no rationale to accept it or reject it. If it's mm -hmm. simply persuasive, then why is it called irresistible grace instead mm -hmm. of persuasive grace? And as I mentioned, uh, and I'll this will be just the last answer, and I'll just use all I can to explain. But simply, it is that the, the term, of course, we agree is terribly defined, which is why we prefer effectual calling, which is simply that while we do resist the grace of God at times, whenever God wants to and chooses that ultimate power of grace due to his omnipotence, he will uh, ultimately use that and that no one can resist at that time that he chooses to use that moment of that quote-unquote irresistible moment of grace. Okay, thank you. Okay, that uh, concludes our cross-examination period. To uh, conclude the debate, we will uh, move on to the uh, two-minute closing statements. Uh, Christian Anarchist goes first, and his time starts now. I want to take a different approach, but of course, if some of you are familiar with me, you'll know that one of my favorite uh, guilty pleasures is looking into church history as well as the early church fathers. So I want to quote something. Uh, thou, sh thou shalt not issue orders with bitterness to thy maidservant or thy manservant, who trust in the same God, lest thou shouldst not reverence that God who is above both. This is from the words of Barnabas in chapter 9 of his epistle, and he makes the following concerning uh, God. Quote, For he came to call men not according to their outward appearance, but according as the Spirit had prepared them. This again is repeated in the Didache, which is a Christian document to introduce Christians to the faith and to give an outline of how they're to approach their faith. In chapter 4, it reads the same thing, but with a bit of a different wording, especially where it says, for he comes not to call according to the outward appearance, but to them whom the Spirit had prepared. Now Ignatius, in his epistle to the Magnesians in chapter 8, states the following, For if we still live according to the Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace, for the divinest prophets live according to Christ Jesus on this account. Also they were persecuted, being inspired by his grace to fully convince the unbelieving that there is one God, who has manifested himself by Jesus Christ, his Son, who is his eternal word, not proceeding forth from silence, and who in all things pleased him that sent him. Friends, I asked uh, you today to consider the gospel message, and rather that is that Christ came to die for sinners, and that we can't do anything by our own standards to receive that grace on our own, for we do not fit the standards that Christ was able to Fence. Rather, by God's grace alone, the Holy Spirit led him into your hearts if you feel his presence. And with that, I end my time. Okay, uh, Trad Al's uh, closing statement period starts. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid my opponent has not clearly demonstrated the difference between First, this irresistible grace and a simple act of persuasion by God. And second, if this is more than persuasion, how it differs logically from free will. I listened to the scripture um, passages which he quoted, but none of them were definitive on this point, at least not in a uh, clear sense. Now, the handy thing about um, debating different Protestant sects is that there's generally a Protestant sect that disagrees with your opponent, and this is indeed the case in Arminians. For example, proponents of Arminians say that in Scripture, this uh, exegesis, I believe it's called, uh, used in John 6.44, where John says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Um, the Arminians say that this word has a uh, non-Calvinistic meaning because in the other senses in which it is used in scripture, um, uh, Jeremiah, for example, said that when he was left in the pit to die, the verb is used for action when his rescue is performed on him. 
after he voluntarily secured the ropes to himself. So it is an act of the person's cooperation um, with God that this grace is allowed. Again, my opponent has not uh, defended how this is this uh, irresistible grace is different from um, denying our free will. Okay, this uh, concludes our uh, debate. Uh, thanks, thank you uh, both debaters for participating, and I hope everyone who watched uh, came away with a clear understanding of the uh, two different positions. Uh, have a nice day, everyone. Uh, thank you for watching, and God bless you all. God bless you too. Um, yeah, thank you for having me today. Amen.